Hi, thanks for listening to my talk. My name is Daniel Morimi and I'm a PhD student at Booster Biotech Institute. Today I'm going to talk about my work on trusted execution environments and attacks on Intel SGX. Copycat controlled instruction level attacks on Enclaves, a joint work with Yo Van Bolt, Nadia Henninger, Frank Pissens, and Berg Sunar. In a traditional security model in the cloud or other multi tenant environments, we assume that the hardware and system software are trusted. Now, with the trusted execution environments, this model has changed. Uh, in Intel SGX, uh, the system software and almost anything that is outside of the CPU die is considered malicious, and the CPU provides uh, protection for security specific modules called enclaves. These enclaves are mapped by the OS and loaded by the user space application, but even OS adversaries are not supposed to read or, or modify the data inside the enclave. Uh, since Intel SGX was released, a new line of research has emerged regarding attacks on Intel SGX and the Enclave software. Some of the proposed attacks break the entire hardware promises, uh, and Intel have issued microcode patches, and they also had to recover the trusted computing base by revo revoking old uh, attestation keys. On the other hand, there is a whole set of other attacks that Intel does not claim to protect against. Uh, these attacks generally leak the memory access pattern and control flow of Enclave at runtime. Uh, and for these, Intel says that it's responsibility of the software developer to apply constant time programming technique to protect their uh, software. There are two categories of these attacks. The first category are side channels based on contention of macroarchitectural resources, uh, for example, by creating contention in the cache or branch predictors. The limitation of these macroarchitectural attacks is that they are not very reliable, they require a lot of engineering effort, and also, as we have seen uh, by another paper in this session, the community has proposed uh, some mitigation for these attacks by blocking the contention of uh, macroarchitectural resources. Now, there is a second category of these attacks that we cannot easily mitigate, and they are called control channel attacks. Uh, the reason these are called control channel attacks is that they are, uh, for the most part, are deterministic, and they exploit architectural features like the way page tables are handled uh, to probe access patterns of enclave programs. In this talk, we introduce a new control channel attack called copycat that is deterministic, but it also has a very high spatial resolution. In Intel SGX thread model, we can control interrupt handlers with high precisions. This means that if we have an enclave thread that executes uh, this instruction over a period of time, uh, we can issue a very high precision timer interrupt to force a context switch on this thread. And the state of the art tool called SGX step can now interrupt an enclave at almost every desired instruction with some degree of noise. For example, here the T1 and T2 shows the boundary of when a scheduled interrupt will happen. If the green bar shows the end of the execution for this first uh, NOP instruction, uh, we know that this interrupt will happen somewhere in this window, which means we'll execute a single instruction or no instruction. Now, let's assume that the interrupt happened right after this knob instruction. Uh, in this case, we have a forward progress in the thread with a single step. Now, by repeating this during the execution of an enclave thread, we get some zero steps and some single steps. But either way, we are going to reach the end of the sequence of operations in an enclave thread. Now, let's say we have issued 15 IRQs to reach to the end of these instructions. How many steps did we take during this time frame? To answer that, we need to know which of these IRQs caused a zero step and which one of them caused a single step. Uh, we have something called a page table entry that holds metadata and virtual to physical address translations. Uh, although a malicious OS cannot access the content of enclave pages, but it can modify or read the metadata of PT entries for these pages. And there is an access speed or a bit in the PTE that helps the OS to have some sort of contract with the CPU to check and determine uh, what memory pages have been accessed before. If you clear the A bit for a code page, the A bit for that page is only set when at least one instruction from the page is retired. As a result, by checking if the A bit is set, we know if our consecutive uh, interrupts caused a single step or a zero step. So we propose these single stepping counts as a side channel itself, by, but unfortunately, this count for an entire execution thread is not a very valuable side channel information. Uh, so we can now combine this information with the secondary channel to count 
the number of instructions executed between two consecutive events such as uh, page accesses or cache accesses. In this paper, uh, we used page table attacks uh, as a secondary deterministic channel uh, to perform a fully deterministic attack with instruction level granularity. Let's assume this call instruction uh, hits a secondary code page. We can trap that event. And then the next time we see another page is hit, for, which in this case, the push instruction access the, the stack page. We know that these two different pages have been accessed. And now if we count the steps just between them, we know that four instruction has been executed between these two events. And we continue this for the next uh, pages as well, and similarly count different, uh, different number of instructions executed between page transitions. Previous control chain attacks only learn the sequence of pages that have been accessed. Now, with Copycat, we have an additional deterministic channel, which tells us how many instructions were executed between page transitions. Why is this information useful? Well, in some algorithms or mitigations for uh, software-based side channels, sometimes we have some branches that are balanced from a, a code page or catch page perspective, and they don't expose themselves to these uh, attackers. And for example, here, the C code shows that the same exact operation are executed on both sides. Uh, however, when you compile this if a statement, the compiler doesn't necessarily generate the same number of instructions uh, for each code path. In this small figure here, we see three different code pages that are involved with this if statement. Uh, a code page that holds the if statement itself, another code page that holds the add function, and a stack page as well. And if you follow the execution one step at a time here, we see that for the true value of this value of variable C, one more instruction is executed before hitting the stack page. This means that by counting how many instructions executed, we could infer what was the decision of that branch, even if they were only different for a single instruction. Now, in some case studies, let's use this copycat attack to efficiently steal some crypto keys in the context of S6. In a cryptographic scheme, there is a very popular algorithm called binary extended Euclidean algorithm. This is used for modular inversion and computing the GCD. Uh, so it's useful for many different public crypto schemes. Uh, previous attacks on this algorithm generally focus on leaking some, leaking some of the branches using cache or page tables. And they also have some measurement noise because uh, cache attacks are not deterministic. Uh, with copycat, we can synchronously recover the outcome of all of these branches in this modular inverse function. We analyzed the trace we could recover from Wolf SSL that used this algorithm, and we noticed that uh, these mathematical uh, subroutines uh, for this algorithm are located in a secondary code page. So by tracking the page that holds this algorithm itself and another page that holds those mathematical subroutines, we can apply the copycat instruction counting technique to recover all the uh, branches at runtime here. Uh, this function is used in many different places. Uh, the, the DSA signature generation algorithm uses it to compute the modular inverse during signature generation. We demonstrated a single trace attack on DSA by just iterating through the deterministic trace and computing the value of K inverse, and then simply computing the private key from the nonce K. In other cases, uh, Wolf SSL used this function to generate RSA keys. Uh, for example, for a value of P and Q as two prime numbers for the RSA private key, uh, another parameter is generated by computing uh, Q in inverse mod P. This time we cannot simply trade through the trace because we have two unknown input of this uh, modular inverse function, but we have an additional information here uh, based on how RSA works, which the public parameter N is the product of the prime P and Q. We proposed a new branch and prune algorithm here based on this relationship with the public value n and the collected deterministic traits. This attack works by making some guesses about the bits of p and q and removing guesses that do not match this relationship. Uh, for example, here we first came up with these four combination of guesses, but two of them don't make sense because of the value of n. And then we just ignore those and expand on the leaves that uh, that that uh, matches the value of n, and we iteratively go through the next bits of n. This tree grows exponentially, so exhaustively going through all these leaves uh, for this tree is computationally expensive, and that's also why the RSA crypto system is not fundamentally broken. 
But here at each stage, we can provide the guess P and key value to a test function that checks if this guess is uh, create the same trace as the recovered trace. And if it doesn't, then we just discard that guess and eventually recover the full value of P and Q from a single execution trace. We also did a similar attack uh, using branch and prune technique on another operation during RSH key generation, uh, this time during the generation of the private uh, key parameter D. We evaluated these attacks. We executed each attack 100 times. For example, we see that for DSA, on average, we need we needed to generate 22,000 IRQs and iterate over 6,000 steps, but these parameters are much bigger for RSA, and uh, we, we see that we have really huge single step traces that we covered with our attack with, with like millions of steps that we tested this. And in all cases, all 100 experiments for each of these attacks match the mathematical model, and we could recover the key with a single trace uh, without any error. We also looked at some other crypto libraries to see if they are uh, similarly vulnerable. As a summary, libgcrypt was also using a variant of the BAA algorithm, and almost all the public key algorithm in this library was affected by this. Uh, we also found that OpenSSL has a vulnerability that uses a, a similar algorithm to compute the GCD, so you could recover the private RSA key during the uh, key generation in one of their code patterns. Uh, we reported these vulnerabilities to all of these vendors. The developers responded and mitigated these issues. Uh, as a conclusion, copycats pushes the limits of these deterministic control chain attacks to instruction level granularity. Uh, it's reliable and it's easy to scale and replicate this attack. Uh, constant time programming, or in this case, branchless programming, is now even harder and more important for SGX. Uh, with this new attack. The question that remains for the community to answer is how can people protect non-crypto programs that are data intensive when they are executed inside uh, this SGX? This is uh, the end of my talk. I'm looking forward to the Q&A and to answer your questions.